Hi, I'm Stuart from Hi5 Pig. We're here at the MOC with Kevin from Living Voice at the High End Munich Show 2023. We're both going to talk a little bit about the new speaker from Living Voice, which is the R80, which was introduced in February at the Deluxe Audio Show in the UK. It was. So tell us a little bit about the speaker, where it comes from, what the background is to it, and whatever you like about it, really. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm sure, you know, as people know, we've had the auditorium series that have evolved over many years. And, you know, there's a performance hierarchy there that delivers, you know, an awful lot of musical coherence and joy and is amplifier friendly. We've got the Vox Palladian, Palladian Basso, Vox Olympian, Vox Elysian, which are, you know, extraordinarily exotic. And there's been this gulf, um, between the RW4 at about £15,000 and the Palladian, which, you know, there's a price that don't speak its name in <laughs> civilised society. And, you know, for years I thought about making a, a compromised a horn system. And then you think about the amount of compromises that you'd need to make to get something that, you know, I've never really designed a product to a price. I've designed things to a performance standard. And it, you know, it, I don't know whether it was an epiphany, but I, I realised that, you know, keep it simple, Occam's razor, you know, make the most grown up two way, mid treble mid, that you, you, that you can imagine. Um, mid treble mid has an inherent, a swathe of inherent advantages, which I like, as manifested in the smaller speakers. And so that's how the design process for the R80 came about. R80, 80 litres internal air volume. So we're using these ScanSpeaker elliptical drive units with this whackingly big 34 millimetre HF unit, which has got a very, very low resonance frequency, okay. which you want to keep away from the pass band. And if you get too close to the pass band, you have to use techniques that have got consequential uh, negatives that you want to avoid. So this thing works incredibly low. Yeah, and then four years of design work and four years of iterative development of endless iterations of, of crossovers with a crossover point at 1900, 2100, 2300, 2600, different slope angles, all sorts of different techniques. I then had a break from designing it, went back to the beginning and started all over again, maybe I don't know, a year or so ago, and just immersed myself in it to the exclusion of everything else. and arrived at something with which I am absolutely delighted. It sounds fantastic. Yeah, There's no great. two ways about it. Is it a simple crossover? Tell us a bit about that. W no. Okay, um, <laughs> It's not simple or you well, won't no, tell us? No, the, I think, I don't know, it's one of the things that seems to be the most misunderstood thing in audio is the crossover. I mean, it, what you hear, I mean, apart from the base mid drive unit's relationship with the internal air volume and the vent tuning frequency and, and getting that alignment correct, apart from that being an important, fundamental part of the design, getting the crossover nailed, what you, what you hear when you listen to loudspeakers largely is the, the quality crossover. of the crossover work. And it defines everything. It defines the tonal balance, it defines the levels, it defines the integration, it defines the off-axis performance. And when you're designing a loudspeaker, you need to juggle loads and loads of, of things at the same time. You know, you can't have the high frequency working too low because it'll get too much excursion, it'll get close to FS, it'll start shaking, and it'll sound like a mess unless you start using very steep slopes which have consequential problems that you may not care for. You can't use the bass mid-drive units too high because they start to beam. So you have to find out where these, these have a, a mind of their own and they tell you what they want. And you have to make crossover after crossover after crossover to see how it responds to your design choices. Your, um, you learn through that iterative process what they're most happy with. Don't have any rigid ideas. Let the drive units tell you where they want to be. And that takes ages. How much of that is done with measurement and how much of that is done with you listening to it? When you start, you've done your theoretical calculation for the internal air volume relative to the, uh, the, the Q parameters of the drive units and blah, blah, blah. You put the drive units, the base mid drive units, forget the HF for now. 
you put them in the box and you would do a sweep with a microphone and you would see what it looked like. And you say, oh, ho, that's pretty horrible. <laughs> you throw something in and choose a component value, say on the base mids, just choose an inductor and see how that modifies the shape. There's no point in listening to it. You can see it's terrible. That tells you, well, double the size, well, half the size, and you sort of work towards something that's sensible. And you say, right, okay, so where's the corner frequency? What's the slope angle? Do we need to have a second order filter, an th electrical filter, a third order electrical filter to achieve the acoustical slope angle that you're after? And so you, you do that and you think, this is workable. And then you do the same with the HF unit and you get something that looks nominally sensible. Mm -hmm. And you make it, uh, you listen to it, and then you begin to judge on music program why it sounds so horrible and you start nibbling away and you can't with, a le with most things in audio but with a loudspeaker in particular you cannot make one change at a time every change you make has got consequential effects everywhere else it's a reactive situation it is nailing jelly to a wall but you get an intuition as to you know you, you often have to make three changes at once to get to where you're going and you do that until you get a result and you, you then think okay I'll go and measure it and see if my disgruntlement correlates with anything I can see and then you go back and, and you make these changes then you begin to understand the drive unit's character and mainly you can see a course that you need to follow and you do iterative you know change 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 and you work through it and then you get something that sounds quite nice and then you can get to something that sounds like it's 90% good then you spend 90% of the work you're going to do on the whole design getting the last 10% absolutely nailed, which is all about listening and adjustment and voicing. If at that point you think, I've made a mistake all the way back there months ago about a choice of crossover angle or something, a crossover point, you have to start again. Loudspeakers, they're divas, they're horrible mistresses, and one of the most important things that you need in loudspeaker design is time. Okay. Time to listen, time to assimilate, time to understand, and time to make changes, and you live with them. And you know, so this is four years of work. And how much of that time was on the crossover? Ninety uh, percent of it. Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah. Okay. So you said there are vented box. How are they vented? Uh, there's a big hole in the back with okay. a tube, the length of which has got a resonance that corresponds with the resonance that we okay. need from these things. Okay. And how low do they go? Well, I haven't got an anechoic chamber, so I don't know, but if you measure them in room, certainly in the room I measure them in at work, you know, I've got um, output of 94 dB sensitivity at 22 hertz. That's, you're probably listening to a room mode, as Simon kindly pointed out. <laughs> but, um, you know, sub these do go subjectively beautifully low with shape and, and, a, and a sort of a weight, and they're on time. There's a lovely combination of virtues that you often find to be mutually exclusive. You can get a fat, rich bass that's got a wetness about it that's rather appealing, but it can't play tunes and it isn't in time. And then you have bass performance that's dry and nimble and immediate, but there's no beauty in there. Now, I'm very happy with this balance. It's got a sophistication in the low end that's very, very pleasing. And it, it's 93 dB with a bit of a BBC dip. Oh, wow. So it's normally 93 dB. The lowest impedances are you know, four and a half ohms, 4.2, so very so amplifier drive. friendly. No rising impedance through the mid-bands, nothing above nine ohms. Uh, delighted. <laughs> In a sentence, how would you describe the sound? Sophisticated, transcendent, musical, not hi-fi. The human expression in the musical performance is the thing that should lead your design choices and your design decisions. And the best music to de design and develop a product with is a captured event, a good captured event, okay. a fantastic, a well-recorded, but a wonderfully performed piece of music with counterpoint and interplay, question and answer, parry, repost, all of that lovely thing, that the artistry of performance and then that allows you to make judgments about relative issues in the performance in terms of tonal colour, dynamic range, overall tonal balance. You don't want any undue emphasis, you want to be led by the musical performance. And what performance did you use in well, the development? But which in particular? Uh, well I'd use the, <coughs> the Vivaldi Gloria, is um, the Christchurch Cathedral recording on Waz O'Leary is particularly good. 
because it's a beautiful spiritual feeling, because music is a feeling, not a sound, or not just a sound. Um, but it's choral, you know, you've got choral episodes, you've got duets, you've got bass strings, mid strings, high strings, you've got your bass singers, baritone, boys in the treble, you've got the natural acoustic, oboe, bassoon, clarinet, baroque organ, all in these episodes. And it tells you just about everything that you need to know about integration and tonal balance and dynamic consistency. But I also want to listen to music that's fun mm -hmm. and sassy and insouciant and cheeky. So, you know, you don't want a system that sounds earnest. You don't want a system that sounds glib and silly. So, you know, you want to be able to explore a very broad and Catholic library of music without being steered by the hi-fi, which is very common. Absolutely. So, obviously you've launched them previously, but you've launched them at Munich today, and it's a business day yesterday and today. How have the speakers been received? Uh, with great warmth and uh, admiration, which is, you know, touching, humbling, and vindicating in equal measure. I mean, some people have kissed them. Really? No. But they, <laughs> <laughs> no, there has been an extremely... Yeah, extremely gratifying feedback um, from people. And you can see that people get stuck in the room and you're playing a very broad range of program material and it, it brooks no argument. We it's walked lovely. in and everybody was just sat yeah. enthralled with me. You could see that people were just sat yeah. really engrossed in the performance. In the performance, that's it. You know, and I, you know, when I, you know a lot of um, audio literature that you read, you know, I, I it's sort of, I, you know, think of an analogy would be, you know, if you look at a painting, you know, the thing that you're going to see in that painting is the expressive content of it and whether it touches you or not. Yeah. And you read quite a lot of audio criticism and they're talking about the tension in the canvas and the thickness of the frame and the thickness of the brush strokes and they absolutely cannot see that it's an expressive artistic thing that is the that is the first, that's the go-to point of it. And it, it, it's almost like a socially contagious mental illness. And it's one that I think we should try and escape from. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so how much are these? You said they, they yeah. fall at that point that you wanted to Yeah, no, fill. I'm delighted um, that they're where, not. Yeah, so how much are they? Well, there's gloss finish and there's outboard crossover mm -hmm. and there's inboard crossover and there's satin finish. So... If my recollection is correct, the, the inboard satin is 41 and the outboard gloss is 52 and you've got two in the middle. I, I won't remember Things in between. Yeah. That, that's front of house work. <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you ever so All much, right. Kevin. It's Thank a pleasure. You. Thank Cheers. You. Thank you.